Hi, my name is Brian Capo, and welcome to this week's Ask Brian part of our weekly newsletter. I really liked one of the questions I got this week because it's something we had thought a lot about, and I'm going to describe a little bit of our thought process when we develop the data science specialization. So before I begin, uh, let me remind you in the description of the videos below, you can sign up for the newsletter, you can ask a question, and if you get a chance, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Okay, so this week's question basically boiled down to what are the steps of a data science or data analysis project? So I'm going to say stages of you know, my data science projects because this is mostly related to the sorts of things that I do. But I think some of the steps are pretty universal. And like I mentioned, we thought a lot about these when we came up with the data science specialization. And so um, I like to uh, uh, you know, I'd like to at least go through our thought process a little bit and focus in on some of the things that I think are some of the key parts of a data science project. So the first one is, of course, data acquisition, however you get the data in the first place. This might just be some project as innocuous as scraping the web or as detailed as one of these 5, 15, 30-year longitudinal cohort studies. So in many of the projects that I work in, it's quite labor-intensive to actually acquire the data. Um, they have to put people in scanners. Sometimes they have to inject them with radioactive material. Um, so anyway, I don't want to belittle data acquisition, but it's highly idiosyncratic and, and specific to the application that you're looking at. So let's just kind of blow by that one and go to the next couple steps. Data cleaning. You almost always have to spend some time fixing up the data. Um, this may be, in, in my case, there's a first step of where you take the raw data that comes off of a scanner, for example, and convert it into usable data that you can use to do analysis with. But even if someone sends you an Excel spreadsheet, there's always problems like there's embedded graphs, the column labels aren't anything that's useful to import into an analysis program. They might have coded missing values as 888s, which is always a problem because when you, if you don't acknowledge that when you read it in, then uh, it's, you, your analysis program is going to treat those values as if they're numerical when they're really intended to be missing values, and so on. So a huge amount of time needs to be devoted to data cleaning, just getting the data in a basically usable format. Data organization, so uh, this is one of, I think, the steps that I spend the most amount of time on. And I gave an example here of wide versus long. If you have you know, repeated measurements on a, on a person, so you know, like I have person, and then I have say measurement one, measurement two, measurement three of let's say the same thing. Let's say I repeatedly measured um, a person's blood pressure at one week, two weeks, three weeks, or something like that. You know, here's person two, they get those three measurements. Here's person three, they get those three measurements. This is in so-called wide format. Wide format is nice because it's nice and compact and it's easy to, to display. It's nice to make heat maps with, with. But another way to display the data would be person one, or organize the data, person one, person one, person two, person two, person two, person three, person three, person three. Measurement one, measurement two, measurement three, measurement one, measurement two, measurement three, measurement one, measurement two, measurement three. That, that way. This is a so-called long format. And the long format is often useful for analysis programs. So it's actually the way in which you have to organize your software you, before you put it into a lot of programs. It's less compact, but it's often more analytically useful. So going between the two is kind of an annoyance. Um, but that's just one example of data organization. And what I mean by data organization is restructuring your data in a way that's useful for you to actually get the interesting results out of it that you're, you're looking for. Um, exploratory data analysis uh, is good, you know, doing graphs, creating summary tables, that sort of thing. It's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good way to spend your time. It's a good way to get to know your data, kind of answer the basic questions. I would say these three steps represent a huge amount of time in data analysis and they had kind of largely been ignored and there's been these great efforts in the R community and then similarly in Python and other com communities, but I know the R community the best, um, to make these steps easier and more fun and easier to teach. And so that's all the tidyverse stuff. If you look up, you know, 
the tidyverse, it'll he head you on the right path to, you know, ggplot for exploratory data analysis, you know, things like dplyr for things like data organization and so on. So there's a bunch of tools out now that make this a lot easier and more convenient than it used to be. So Chris Falinski came up with the idea of exploratory models, or that's where I heard it from. And I really like the idea. I think the idea is quite old, but I think he really articulated it well. Um, the, this is the idea of, you know, kind of fitting a bunch of models, but you're not thinking of them as sort of the one true model. You're using your model as sort of a lens through which you look at your data. You know, just like if you, um, you, you might look at the same piece of matter with a microscope, with binoculars, with your naked eye, with your, uh, you know, uh, look at its spectral properties and so on. And all these are different ways of looking at of looking at it through different lenses. So you might think of a model, there is no truth to this thing, right? There is, there is no, um, all of these are giving you, in a sense, a, a, a correct answer. They're just giving you the answer through the lens at which they can show it. So some things zoom in close, some like satellite imaging view very far away. So, so when you think about models that way, not as, a, not as like trying to fit the one true model that is you know, going to give you exactly correct inferences, if you think about them as exploratory tools where you're thinking about them in the same way a, a person who who's, has to study something visually thinks about different lenses, then, um, uh, then that's a very useful thing to do. It also tends to bring out some important features in the data that you wouldn't otherwise see. So I like to call that process exploratory modeling and it's, it tends to be a big component for me. Then I might, after that, approach whatever formal modeling and or machine learning that I, I would be doing at that point. Um, now, if you're doing formal modeling, you know these two steps you have to be careful because you you know there's things like error rate control that you have to worry about. You're fitting a bunch of models. Are you kind of skewing your results and burning through your error rate? That sort of thing um, by fitting a ton of models ahead of time. And so you have to worry about that if you're doing kind of formal modeling and inference. Um, for machine learning, again, you have to make sure you're not overfitting um, by doing all these exploratory models and encoding the information into your machine learning. So uh, you, know, you wanna try and think of these things ahead of time to, to avoid things like overfitting or, or you know, skewing all your, all your error rates. Um, but at any rate, that, the formal modeling is the idea of, well, I'm trying to get out a, a, you know, some final models that I'm going to try and present to people at, later on at some point. And then I usually want some sort of inference. I want to be able to quantify the uncertainty of my models. I want to generalize my models to the population. Uh, often when I do inference, I want to make sure, again, that I, I am you know, controlling error rates in some sense or doing something that's inferentially valid. Um, you know, or if I'm giving predictions, it's nice to do some sort of bootstrapping, cross-validation, some sort of procedure that then I can get things like uh, error rates around my predictions. So at um, any rate, some sort of inference usually goes next. And then uh, a part of the project that usually gets omitted in discussions of kind of statistical curriculum or many data science curriculum is, is the idea of the end result being a product. And by a product, I mean a reproducible presentation, a reproducible report. Um, an app, a website, that sort of thing. And this is another area where there's been a lot of recent advances. So again, these areas, the exploratory models, modeling and machine learning and inference, there's been you know, decades of work on that, great software, you know, many of our most brilliant minds working on that stuff uh, you know, for, for a long period of time. And so there's been lots of interesting discoveries for a long time on that. But on this on these, these two fronts, there's, there's just been kind of a recent renaissance. We went from kind of the dark ages to this renaissance. And there, now there's, you know, the, you know, and just in R, let's forget about for the moment all the interesting things that are going on, um, Python and Jupyter and things like that. But just in R, there's, there's been, you know, Slideify and, uh, you know, pre presentations, our studio pres presenter and um, Markdown and Knitter and, and Shiny and all of these uh, tools that help you know, people who are trained as analysts and data scientists who maybe don't know as much about app development, you know, tools that help them create these final products or at least prototypes of the products without having to then also, you know, devote the, op you know, have the opportunity cost of becoming a full-fledged app developer. Um, instead, they can devote their time on the core part of their, of, of their um, an analysis 
And if later on someone wants to develop a super fancy app, maybe they can, but, but these, the ability to create like a, a very nice product without as much effort, that, that has really seen a lot of uh, improvement lately. And I, I would especially point out um, Shiny as one of my favorite new tools for being able to do that. Okay, so those are the steps that I would say. And um, you know, if, if I have one little bit of advice, it would be don't forget about carrying things to the stage of a product. And in, in general, if you think about the sort of a ladder of completeness of a data analysis project, you know, try to carry it as far as you can and then try and go at least one step extra. And you know, if you, if you carry it to, uh, to some written document, you know, try and make a reproducible report. If you carry it to a reproducible report, try and make a shiny app. If you carry it to a shiny app, maybe try and get some nicer app to, to be developed after that. So um, at any rate, that's my thoughts on the stages of a data, sci data science project. Um, Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you get a chance. Uh, sign up for the newsletter and ask a question. I'll see you next week.